This is the E of uh, real estate. My name is uh, René Stevens and today um, my guest is Tom uh, Saunders. Uh, Thomas Saunders has devoted much of his uh, professional life uh, exploring the bonds, linking architecture, nature's uh, geometry and authentic tarot archetypes with uh, the human experience, our health and the world about us. He is a uh, chartered architect and a fellow of the Royal Institute of British uh, Architects, the RIBA, and he was a visiting uh, lecturer on professional practice and business management at the School of uh, Architecture, now known as the University of East London. Yes. His uh, presentations and uh, seminars expressed uh, perennial uh, esoteric wisdom of the arts and the sciences that have been taught throughout the ages. And uh, Gotes quote, uh, architecture is frozen music inspired you <laughs> yes. to uh, research the fundamental principles of uh, design, uh, geometry and the structure of a building based on uh, harmonic ratios, musical intervals and proportional volumes. Uh, these will uh, resonate with the same harmonic ratios in our body, uh, such as vibrational sounds and colors yeah. create a life-enhancing uh, environment. Mm. He was uh, the founder and CEO of the architectural firm uh, the Thomas Saunders Partnership, TTSP, yes. with about 130 uh, staff. And uh, after about uh, 21 years, he uh, uh, retired as a senior partner. Because at that time he got inspired by uh, Joseph Campbell's remark, uh, the real killer in life is when you are at the top of the ladder and realize it is leaning against the wrong wall. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and at that point uh, you knew uh, you had to move on and uh, explore wider horizons, as you did. And since his uh, retirement uh, from TTSP in uh, 1984, he has acted as an independent consultant architect and writing and presenting seminars. Uh, yes. He was uh, chairman to one of the project management companies of city merchant developers. And um, he has presented seminars on uh, Plato's uh, seven liberal uh, arts, on sacred geometry, uh, Vitruvius in the UK and uh, the United States. Yeah. And uh, this work uh, resulted in writing uh, a book, The Boiled Frog Syndrome, yes. <laughs> Your Health and the Built Environment. And that yeah. is exactly the theme that I would like to discuss with you uh, today. Right. The, there were some more books you uh, wrote, like uh, Health Hazards and Electromagnetic Fields in Hospital Design and Equipment. Yes. And you even wrote uh, a book about uh, the authentic tarot. And I also want to hear more because that is not something you hear very often an architect combines. Uh, no, quite. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, and it's about uh, discovering your inner self. Yes. And um, there was also an autobiography, uh, Getting Alive. And as I understood, <coughs> you uh, just finished a new book. It will be published uh, and released in uh, 2020, beginning probably February. Yes, February probably. Uh, the Thoughts on Architecture, Myths and Management. It's also a uh, provoking title, the, this combination, Architecture, Myths and Management. And to uh, add up on this, uh, he's a practicing dowser was a long-term member of the National Federation of Healers and an associate lecturer at the University of the Arts in London. So you can say uh, you are not an average uh, architect at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and in this podcast I would like to focus on the learn and working environment in the campus uh, 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 surroundings. <clears throat> How can uh, uh, rethinking that environment uh, enhance this, the experience of the students and the staff and uh, maybe also the study outcome. Yes. And how can a learning environment that consists for me about the physical part, the digital part and a social part uh, be used as a management tool? And maybe your book can sh shed some light on that, uh, your latest book. Uh, so it's not only about the organizational goals of uh, the university, but also about the experience and the health and uh, well-being and maybe even consciousness of people employed and studying in that uh, university environment. Uh, 
I wrote a nice uh, introduction uh, text in your uh, autobiography, so I want to uh, oh, yes. uh, quote that <coughs> uh, to um, even color, color more your exceptional combination of uh, qualities as an architect. Uh, and uh, it goes as follows, uh, actually it sums it up. How many architects do you meet who have traveled 1500 miles into the Amazon, lived in the Arctic with the Inuits, uh, sailed the Atlantic and followed the personal quest, taking in healing, dousing the wisdom of the tarot and myths, the study of ancient symbolism, sacred geometry and the healing powers of buildings. So that's quite something. Uh, <laughs> so actually that's, that's the reason why I asked you to have an interview with you, to share all, the, all these wisdom uh, that you gathered all over the years. Um, so as an opening, I'm, with all these personal uh, quests, um, I'm uh, interested if you can tell me who is Tom Saunders and uh, why is he here? And uh, <laughs> what is his destiny? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, that is uh, the big question I think we ask ourselves when we are in our 40s. Who am I? Why am I here? And what's my destiny? And I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. <laughs> I'm just waiting to, uh, to live as I am now. And I think that with the work that we do as uh, whether we're architects or engineers or uh, uh, accountants or whatever the whatever the profession or, or business you're in is there is a tendency to compartmentalize and to stay in that and so that when you get to the age of 65 if you like um, and then you say, well, I'm now retired, but you retire always to imagine that that's your, the, I was an architect, I was a, a, an engineer and so on. And that tends to, as soon as we give a name to something, so it tends to confine it and to, and it also fragments it. And so there's an awful lot of fragmentation now, particularly about architecture and the way in which architecture is practiced, that we have fragmentation, compartmentalization, and it means that uh, uh, your, your view tends to be narrowly directed to specialization. And uh, when we get to the bit about leadership, you cannot do that uh, and be a, a specialist if you're a leader. You, you, you need to be, you need, you need specialists uh, to carry out the strategy, but you are, you are um, uh, somebody who is not um, confining the, the, the narrow, you've got to have a, a wider picture, if you like. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a wider picture. So actually what you are saying is that an architect should be more, uh, sh should take uh, his or her responsibility as a leader because it is more a conductor of several specialists. He, he or she should have the bigger picture what is this building all about, what we are designing or what we are refurbishing? Yeah. Exactly, and, and that's what I write about in my latest book, that uh, the, the architect should have a broad picture about um, the world about us, about nature, about ecology, and about, about being the leader, and to understand that the the, the, the heritage of architecture and architects goes back to megalithic times where whether it's a, a um, whether you, when you have like feng shui the, uh, the uh, Chinese system of, of, of building code you get, in India you get Vastu Shastra another building code if you like and these were codes that were directed towards uh, uh, to directed p 
people towards um, when they're built, particularly when they're building their own homes or their own houses, that uh, they are making sure that their health and well-being and the environment is um, the best that can be produced and that you're there with security. And so uh, the, uh, the way to do that was that you have to have people who are understanding uh, bio the, the, the biological nature and the physical nature of, of human beings and, and what goes on in the ground where you can make get materials and so on. So all that is uh, what the architects did. We didn't call them architects. And even with the building the great cathedrals of, of Europe, for example, or uh, further back into Angkor Wat and, uh, and, and so on, that these were the architects who um, were the healer priests. They were the people who set the harmonic ratios. They understood what was in the ground. Then the first thing they would do would be to make sure you've got water <laughs> so that you can survive. And so this is where um, the training of architects since the so-called enlightenment, when uh, these more esoteric aspects, if you like, uh, of architecture and the teaching of architecture um, and, and the practice of architecture, all this uh, started to implode when in the Enlightenment uh, it was decided that, uh, to ignore metaphysics, go to scientific physics and uh, to um, dismiss the soul or the psyche because you couldn't measure it. And so um, immediately that aspect of, of design and architecture was completely shut off and in the dark. So uh, when I say it in a, in a different uh, context, so architects are more like uh, shamans. Uh, keepers of the ancient wisdom. Exactly Actually, as they, should, they be. should be, as they were. Yeah. I think that they, they were the, the dragon master of Feng Shui, for example. Uh, yeah, he was the nearest thing. And um, uh, when you design buildings according to the Feng Shui um, code, if you like, that uh, a lot of people think it's mumbo jumbo, a lot of nonsense. But um, when they, they say uh, in, in the code, um, don't build foundations on black soil. And you immediately think of, oh, it's black. There's something about being black. Uh, it's and to do with death or whatever. But a black soil is black because it's full of minerals and, and uh, all sorts of uh, ingredients, if you like, in the in the soil, which will start to eat away at the timber, mm -hmm. at the timber foundation. So you don't do that. So there's an awful lot of, of, of profound common sense that will, uh, will come forth and help people because they were building their own, um, to help people to create healthy environments for themselves. And that's, it's like uh, with the, in Feng Shui again, they say, well, you know, you have fountains and you have running water. And we know now that the more you have running water and that it increases the negative ions. And negative ionization is vital uh, to keep us um, alive and, and awake. And so the, there was a, a great deal of science <laughs> in Feng Shui and Vastu Shastra. And in Europe, we had Civitas. Same sort of, every culture and organization has had the same 
uh, um, coding, if you like, which was designed by the so-called architects, but they weren't, yeah, you're right, it's like sh shamanism, that they were the people who understood uh, the uh, psychology and the biology and the physiology of, of, of human beings and the earth. Yeah, actually, you, you could maybe take, uh, draw a parallel with uh, medicines or also there. Uh, of course. Uh, Sometimes we lost the connection and thought that we can solve everything with drugs and just repair it as if it is a machine. Yes. So uh, holistic medicine is uh, already a little bit further than holistic architecture, but there's a lot of parallels between the two. So it, Absolutely. It, 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 it's all about health and well-being of people who are using these buildings. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, as a healer, I, I work in the, what is called the etheric body and um, where you can actually feel it uh, outside the physical body, you can feel it, it's like a soft balloon, soft cushion and there you can feel where it's a bit ragged and jagged and you can smooth it out and it, it's particularly good for people with pain. <laughs> Uh, if they've broken their wrist or bone, whatever, you you can relieve that pain, mm -hmm. and it's not just all in the mind, as it were. And this is this is what folk wisdom comes in, as and we'll talk about that later in in terms of management. But folk wisdom is something which uh, um, was. Or, always understood and and not the scientific um, mind mm -hmm. that goes in. Yeah, that brings me to uh, you. We, we had already a talk last night about uh, perennial mystery school teachings and uh, how modern management uh, is an effective tool and an ethical guide in business activities and politics. So how can architecture or, or the built environment uh, be play a role in that? Uh, play a role in in, in uh, so the wisdom from uh, ancient times, from the mystery schools, and uh, so what can we learn as uh, for modern uh, ah, management, see, yeah. and what can yeah. we learn for modern buildings from this old wisdom? Uh, what should we well, alter, I or should we alter anything? Well, I I think that. First of all, if you go to um, Mount Olympus <laughs> and the Greek gods, or whether you go to the Greek or the Roman or to any, any other um, uh, um, ancient text about uh, the hierarchy of, of gods and goddesses, these are archetypal, they're, they're, their characteristics are the archetypal characteristics of us. And so um, you will always have um, a god or a goddess, the immortals, telling us something about what we have, which is innate and within us, because we have these same archetypal characteristics that, that come and go, and uh, it's like with the, the six major um, goddesses that um, you will find that, uh, that, that there are, it, it, the six major goddesses are telling us about the, um, the, uh, the feminine principle and the aspects of the feminine principle which women go through in, in their lifetime. And uh, so the more you can understand how uh, the, the masculine principle and the feminine principle work and how they are expressed in symbolism of archetypes, then uh, you, you cut through all the, 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 the other stuff, if you like, and you get down to the actual core of, of who we are and what makes us tick. And so, um, uh, with, for example, there's uh, the book called uh, Kings, Warriors, Magicians and Lovers. And uh, I find this 
one of the best uh, books on business management uh, because what it's saying is that there are these four major uh, characters of the uh, male psyche and so you, you will always have a king who is the titular head and kings are people who uh, are uh, they bless uh, the the subjects they they protect they uh, uh, meet out justice and so on that's in their best way and of course then you get the tyrant who will uh, just do everything in the opposite way so you get um, uh, kings who are the the leaders they conduct the, the the reign if you like and then you get uh, um, magicians and the magicians are the people in your business for example they're the people who are the backroom boys they are the the accountants they are the uh, the inventors and they're the people who are extremely creative and they create magic then you get the warriors who go out on their white chargers because they are the people who, for example, they go out to, if you want somebody to sell something, if you want somebody to do something, you find a warrior. And um, so, so there's no point in having, uh, um, promoting a magician and saying, well, no, you've got to go out and, and sell them or you've got to market they are, are in square pegs in the round holes and in the same way this is the, the fault of the education system if you like that the best uh, um, teachers are the people who are um, in order to improve their status and income they have to be promoted out of doing what they do very well and go into administration. They become the head teacher. And uh, that is just a waste of, of, of talent in many ways. There are people, of course, who uh, can multitask and do all these things and bring into the other job, if you like, uh, great wisdom and, and knowledge of that. But generally, um, don't ask a magician to go and be a warrior, in, and vice versa. And then you get the lover, and the lover is the poet. Uh, and, but you'll get the king and the warrior and the magician creating all sorts of wonderful things, and then the lover says, just a minute, how is that going to affect the ecology? How does that affect the environment? What does it do to people who are, and so on? So he or she, as, as a lover, as, is the person who, who, who mentors these people and say, well, just a moment, and think about other things other than just purely rushing it or going out and doing things. But you, um, but you, you don't, if, if they, if the, the lover, um, starts to become subversive and and uh, you can tell the lover when you say to the lover um, I want you to just can you just arrange to uh, the, the chairs for this lecture and we're going to have them uh, in a uh, all round so that we got a, like a round table and he'll think oh or she think no I think we'll have them straight <laughs> and just be difficult if you like and they are the people who are subversive so you have to be careful of them the warrior can be a uh, can be uh, very cruel and uh, just does everything and kills off people and the magician can be the the confidence trickster he's the cheat so you you you, you get the plus and minuses of these people but they are there to uh, once you start to look at the symbolism uh, that comes out 
uh, in in uh, in myths and fairy tales, then you, and and the archetypal characteristics characters that you get that run through an authentic deck of, of tarot cards, uh, it's it's profound stuff. And uh, Albert Einstein said, um, if you want your children to be clever, no, do, no. He said, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. And if you want your children to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, uh, even with the Bank of England, quite recently, I, I quoted in my book, uh, where the, somebody in the Bank of England said, um, we should listen we should take less notice of uh, spreadsheets, the accountants, and the London economists, and listen more to folk wisdom. Now that's from the Bank of England. <laughs> so. Okay, so that makes almost a circle round again, that uh, we started off with uh, 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 saying that the architect should be more a uh, uh, having more and a holistic approach, but also the client or the, the, the board members of a organization should have a more balanced view and a, a balanced system to manage uh, or to lead yes. an organization. Yes. Uh, and, um, but that goes then also for an architectural firm, because, uh, or is the architect someone, he is the uh, shaman and he knows everything in balance. The, no, he, the, he doesn't know everything. Yeah. But what he does know is his limitations. Oh, okay, that's a very good <laughs> and, start. And he, know, and he knows. I have to say that um, I was not a brilliant designer. Uh, I, I had other uh, things that made me want to uh, create uh, or to found a new, a new practice, which I did from my little back bedroom in... Uh, in 1961 and, uh, and then it grew very quickly and, and so on and became an international practice uh, within I think 10 years and so on but um, uh, and, and then by the time I retired 22 years later 23 years later so um, it was a, 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 an international practice with overseas offices and a staff of about 130 people. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I knew that uh, I'd, I'd, I'd reached what I set out to do. And although it still keeps my name, the Thomas Saunders Partnership, it was their choice, not mine. And, it, and the practice still goes. And it, it's still thriving. And that's because I handed it over to the four partners I created and uh, knew that they could carry on. I think that's, that is the right thing to do. And there was another book, apart from the quote from <laughs> Joseph Campbell, uh, and as soon as you quote the Joseph Campbell, people have a very strange laugh. <laughs> and they, oh yes. And uh, pulls them up to think, well, um, is, is my ladder leaning against the wrong wall? Yeah. But there was another man called, Town I think it was Townsend, and Robert Townsend, who wrote um, Up the Organization. Uh, this, was in, this was in the uh, 50s or 60s when he wrote it, where he suggested that what you should do is that if you are as the CEO, if you're in that leadership, you should do it for five years and then move on so that the people down in the next in line have got something to do. So when I left, I, I severed all relationships when, and with, uh, with the business, with the practice, because I thought it was just the, not to hold on as a consultant and so on. Uh, no, you've got to you've got to go away and and and, and uh, because I had much more to do and to say than being our revered founder and senior partner. <laughs>
when I left. So when we are looking at the architect uh, mm -hmm. profession, that it is uh, actually too much uh, uh, making, putting into compartments and, uh, and nobody has the over really overview. You're also saying that on the other side of the table, the, the client or the, the owner or uh, the, the leadership of a organization using a building, they should also be more holistic, having a more holistic approach. Uh, so somehow during, uh, after the enlightenment uh, age, we lost connection with uh, the real stuff. Uh, so intuition, uh, the, the folk uh, wisdom. Um, do you have any suggestion how to bring it back besides reading your book? Uh, <laughs> um, do you have some pr a practical uh, um, uh, suggestion? Well, I, I think first of all, uh, if we do look back, there was the, one of the reasons I, I, I in a part of the book is that there was a man called uh, Bernard Rudofsky. In the 1964, I think it was, he wrote a book called Architecture Without Architects. And um, uh, I was to counter that saying, there've always been architects, uh, shaman, shamans. Uh, and because the people who came out of caves 10,000 years ago or whatever, if they were in caves that is, uh, they were helped to um, to to create their their houses and their, where they their dwellings, if you like, uh, in a, in a, a healthy way, and so um, there are some fundamental principles, the core of being an architect, and that was being of service, and so it, through the book, I quote it, and I quote it on the back cover as well. The, uh, the motto or the epigraph, if you like, of the, RI, of the Royal Institute of British Architects, which is, is a translation of the Latin uh, epigraph, which says, to be an architect, to be of service to the citizens and the glory of the city. That's the translation. And so architects their raison d'etre, if you like, is to be of service and to be of service to the citizens and the glory of the city. In other words, to create the environment and be, to create what was there. But we, we don't do that mostly because architects are not taught anything about the, how to create the building from the inside out. It's always about what the building looks like. In other words, we are wonderful theatrical costumiers. We, we do what the client says, oh, I want to make it uh, Tudor Bethan or Gothic or ultra modern or whatever the brutalism, whatever it may be, that we create that um, and lead the client on to believing that um, we are just creating um, a facade. It's facadism. Whereas, and, and that is why uh, currently we have so many people who are very talented who have really taken over the interior design of buildings. And uh, architects have just relinquished that. They've allowed that to happen because they, they're not interested. They, oh no, I'm, I want to, to do this. So I hear you saying that uh, somewhere along the road we lost our road. We got really lost. I was for many years uh, a Boy Scout and a Boy Scout master. And oh, yes. one of the things we uh, learned or we teach the, the boys is when you got lost, go back to the place where you uh. were sure where you were, what the, the coordinates they were. So actually you are saying a similar thing. So go back to your roots and, and re reinvent or find back uh, what it is all about being an That is the essence of drill at sea for rescue. You go, you return to where it most likely 
the person went overboard or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is part of the drill. And it, uh, that's how it works. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> okay, and that uh, goes uh, actually also for management teams, as I hear you saying. Yeah? Looking at those archetypes, all this ancient uh, mystical wisdom, and, and uh, not even mystical, uh, this uh, just no. when you ask somebody on the street, he can tell you that because it's common sense. Yes. Uh, so so you, if, if you're promoting, if you're in a position of being the, uh, uh, in command and control, in other words, you're in that leadership position. You need to understand who these people are. First of all, you need to understand yourself, <laughs> and then, but then, and that because that helps enormously to understand other people. And uh, what you're not going to pigeonhole them, but you're just going to see what their major archetypal characteristics are so that you know that you, you're not going to promote in or, or to put in front of them to, or, or even to engage, to, to, to uh, commission somebody to come and work with you. Yes. Yeah, actually, um, when I try to uh, say it in my words, what I hear, that you say uh, many organizations uh, experience uh, their accommodation, their buildings, as operational headache. Ah, just technical stuff, uh, maintenance, and yes. it costs too much money. Uh, but uh, in fact, it's a management tool. That's what you're telling. Yes. And um, could you elaborate a little bit more about that? What to explain to a board member, in this case a university, how he or she can use uh, the campus environment as a management tool? to achieve uh, organizational objectives? Well, I think the, the, that if you go to, for example, we, we, let's take the, whether it's the uh, um, king, warrior, magician or lover, or you go to, for example, the ones I quote, the six goddesses, that you will find those people. And when you, when you find the Athena, the Athenas are the, are the, 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 the women the, it, who, with their, uh, the feminine characteristics, if you like, the, the female um, the psyche, would say that with Athenas, they're the ones who are great, they've got great intellect and, and, and they have uh, an, a, a, a great understanding of independence. They want independence and they want power. And so they're the good ones to put in to that position. If, on the other hand, you want uh, to um, go to, shall we say, um, a, a, a Demeter, and Demeter was, she was Mother Earth. She was, she looked after the hearth. Um, you can imagine her with uh, a couple of babies on her each arm, as it were. She was Mother. And so, um, that characteristic, which goes through uh, women anyway, it's, it's not just one characteristic, it's, it's a part of it, but they're the sort of people you would look for who um, would be in the caring mode, if you like. And then you get, um, uh, um, if you like, you get uh, Persephone, who was, um, she uh, wanted power, of the of the occult power of the underworld, and so she would understand very much uh, um, the 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 way the psyche works. But she wanted power, whereas Hera, who was the the empress, he, she was uh, Zeus's empress, and Zeus, as as uh, as the emperor, and the uh, the head of uh, Mount Olympus. Uh, he was a philanderer. He uh, was going around um, uh, changing his uh, body, going, being a, a peacock one minute and a swan and wh whatever, so that he could seduce the women he wanted to seduce. And Hera, his wife, the empress, um, she turned a blind eye to all that. 
and she was she knew what he was doing but she wanted to share his power so you get one aspect of power with Hera and the other aspect of power with Persephone and so um, if you like the a personification of um, of a hero would be Hillary Clinton when you got Bill Clinton whatever he was up to but she and there are lots of women who, who are in that same position as long as they can share the she wanted to share the political power and, uh, and she has many other characteristics but that was her main one mm -hmm. And the same way with with uh, the masculine principles of of, of the um, king lover warrior and uh, king um, lover warrior and, and the magician, mm -hmm. they are uh, characteristics that we can we the, the more we understand all it is is just understanding how the psyche works, and if you are in a position of of, of leadership and you are the CEO if you like you 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 need to understand however you go about it whether you read fairy tales or not or go to Mount Olympus or you go to the tarot it, it helps you to understand what you need to give that those people to create um, a, a working environment that is enhancing for them, it enhances their life, it, uh, it gives them protection as well and it gives them, keeps them healthy and um, this is uh, when some, you might move, move into a, a new building, uh, the first thing you should check would be the air conditioning and how dark the windows are because that affects the pineal gland and so on and it, but in other words you, you're, you're getting down to some fundamental principles and the core of doing business and the core of doing business is people so um, when you have figured out as management team what the ideal combination is uh, in uh, male uh, characteristics and uh, female characteristics, you have your ideal team, they're working perfectly together. Could you say that the environment in which they are doing whatever they are doing should be a manifestation of that balance? Yes, of course. And, and so that means that the architect uh, who is uh, assigned with designing it or refurbishing it should go into this and figure out what is going on here, what is the balance, what is the policy, how are they trying to organize that thing and, and uh, design an according building to that. The first thing uh, you, you would do would be to uh, understand the organization structure of your client and, uh, and but then he wants to move or she wants to move into uh, a new build environment and if you're prepared to take anything so long as it keeps out the wind and, and, and rain then um, you just shove them in and um, use as, as, as much space as possible for, uh, for as many people as possible and uh, that doesn't create the environment that you want but it's to, uh, to engage the architects who understand um, the, what the vibrations of that building is, what is and, and to make sure that the colour, because all colour gives off a certain vibration, it, it, it changes as it goes through. And, the, and, and for example, and particularly so with hospitals, that one of the things I cite in the book is to say, well, uh, um, uh, you, you might have in the team uh, the quantity surveyor and you, uh, you say you're going to paint that wall and he will or she will price it up so much a, a square meter for painting it three coats or, or the color doesn't matter. To the architect, if it 
specified, for example, um, a ward for uh, people with mental conditions, that are poor mental conditions, uh, and, he, he, and he decided to paint it yellow, it would just make the people with their mental conditions uh, far worse. Because yellow demands, it's a, it's a, it's a colour of the, of the chakras that as you go through, it's the Indian system, but um, it, it's the colour of the gut. And if you have something yellow, then uh, you know that it demands logic, it demands attention. And uh, that's the last thing that people with mental conditions n really need, they f from time to time, but, but not to live in that environment for very long. So an architect should be uh, uh, also a kind of management consultant and uh, and, yeah, well that's, and, and, that, and exactly. be coming in back as, as, a, as a shaman, a uh, carrier of wisdom, uh, so doing their job well. They, sh they should be very broad educated. Uh. One of the there are one of the gr things that comes out with Vitruvius and with all the other people I've quoted, Feng Shui and so on, is is uh, about medicine. And Vitruvius uh, um, said the architect should understand medicine not be not be a, a general practitioner or be a consultant but should understand by what he meant by medicine would be to understand about the biology the endocrine glands the pineal gland how that affects how light affects us how and, and the electromagnetic fields and so on and so um, uh, there should be, uh, in, in the education of architects, it, undoubtedly, we should start to un understand uh, about the psyche, about the psychology of people. And how you go about that is, um, you, you're not going to teach them to, to prescribe medicine, but you're just going to un let them understand how people tick what they do and how it how the environment affects uh, uh, the, the, and the and the vibrations affect the people and this is what we under what we know very well uh, with dowsing and uh, um, one of the difficulties with for architects uh, was when the water companies started to lay pipes <laughs> because um, uh, you could phone up the water company and say well where is your pipe and they'll send you a little plan and and so you just connect up to it uh, whereas in the first thing that you would do as an architect before that period it would be to make sure you've got a source of potable water that will last you for some time. And the way in which you do that will be to either be a dowser or to engage a dowser. But we, everybody can douse. Um, uh, um, on the, the uh, seminars that I give about dowsing is that it, it is intuition at work. Um, and in the, in the book, I, my, the last chapter is called the, the Art of Knowing. It's, it's intuition at work. And we, we're, all, we're all doing this, the, uh, reacting to the, uh, the, the vibrations, but we dismiss it. And we, oh, it's, it's just a feeling. And of course it's a feeling. And you should react to it. You should, you should respect that feeling. So, um, in management terms, they're looking for innovation and uh, collaboration between people and war for talent and all these uh, buzzwords uh, and, and thinking that uh, when you read uh, a management book, uh, you can figure it out how it works. 
But actually what you are saying is, uh, besides that, of course, understanding how things work and how people tick, the environment is a, is a really important component uh, because it can enhance but also uh, can destruct things what you yes. uh, yeah. try to achieve. Uh. Yeah, and the last thing that architects do now is to create the environment, hmm. uh, the interior environment. They are creating a facade. Hmm. And, um, of course, there are extraordinary buildings where, yeah, when you walk in, you, you, it, it does create what you want and so on. And, uh, but mostly uh, buildings are designed from the outside and not from starting from the inside. How a person sits at a desk where they're going to be doing this with their computer or whether they're, where they're going to sit in their sitting room or, and, or how you open a door. And when you've opened the door, what happens inside that room <laughs> and so on. And you can tell from a, a, a drawings that architects produce just how uh, acutely aware they may be or not uh, about um, uh, simply by where they place the door, where it swings and, and where it's in the wall. What I hear uh, often in my practice uh, from both sides that architects says, say, yeah, of course, that's, yeah, you're completely right, that's what I want to do, but my client, he or she does not understand. On the other side, when I have uh, clients uh, who are not architects but uh, are running an organization, they say, ah, those architects, they, don't <laughs> understand, they understand nothing about uh, business. Uh, um, yeah. So somehow we are uh, uh, running around <laughs> and don't come out of the of the hole. Uh, so what could be an incentive to give a push or an impulse uh, that we can overcome this uh, status quo? Uh? Well, I know that when Dan Dennis Lasden was designing the Royal College of Physicians in Regent's Park here in London, uh, that um, it's a, an extremely modern building. And they were reciting their organization from uh, um, a, a heavily, heavily classical building in the West End of London. So um, this ultra modern building, which I, uh, we know very well, um, he only showed them plans. <laughs> he, he didn't, I mean, Christopher Wren had the same trouble. Christopher Wren wanted a dome. His clients wanted to spire, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you don't show them. <laughs> but, but I think that most clients want to be led. Mm. They, uh, this is uh, like with children, um, they want to be uh, brought along. They want to be initiated, if you like, mm -hmm. into what's going on. But if the person knows not very much about design or whatever and the environment, not going to bother to talk to the, but, or even to help the, the client to do things because, uh, to, or, or to go along with what they're doing. Because that's, that's talent as well, understanding who this client is, what are his archetypal characteristics mm -hmm. what is he up to the more you understand that and for example when you are presenting drawings to uh, a client um, you assume that he sees the same drawings that you do mm -hmm. and he doesn't mm -hmm. he could be far more concerned with what he hears mm -hmm. and so the best thing with a, an audio based client is to show him the drawings and then walk him through the corridors and uh, this is how you come in the entrance and so talk to him and you get another client who is totally kinesthetic and feels things so you give him a pencil <laughs> or a pen and you let him actually touch the drawing so that and you can show him and, and so on so these are the things where you can um, start to um, 
get your ideas over to um, to, to, to get the, the client with you. Bearing in mind that unless you have a client, you without a client you don't have a business. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that when somebody says, oh I want to commission you to build me a new whatever it may be, then you feel so flattered that oh, and, uh, ooh, <laughs> I've, I've got a new project to do. Well, good to be enthused by that but then you've got to get down to some serious business about why that client is doing it and what he hopes to achieve mm -hmm. and then give him better than he thinks. Yeah, exactly. That brings me back to the point, uh, be also a, uh, a management uh, consultant. Yes. Besides an, uh, an architect. Uh, and, uh, and for that you, yeah, you need to understand the business uh, of your oh, client. Oh, you do. And help him to uh, use the built environment as a management tool okay if this is what you want to achieve uh, you know a lot of how to uh, uh, stimulate people or how to attract people how to organize yeah. your business how to account it whatever uh, but i have expertise in the whole uh, surroundings the environment yeah. in which this all happens and i and you'd want to know who is sitting next to whom and what they do so that when you've got uh, um, a multi-story headquarters building where are you going to put these people and who are they what are they doing who are they related to and how do they work in the organization and how well, how does the organization work because most organization structures are uh, uh, introspective they are impl they, they are there to run the business, they are, whereas they should be running, uh, exploring outside um, uh, how to get more clients, if you like, uh, but also to express to the outside world what your organisation does, whereas and 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 what is their philosophy? What is its philosophy? Whereas most. Uh, um, organization structures are are very implosive mm -hmm. they they are uh, oh this is what we do and <laughs> yeah we touch uh, two of the three things uh, in my definition of an environment so the physical part uh, the what people mostly think that is the architect's work uh, make a structure uh, we touched about uh, the social <laughs> environment yes. uh, the, uh, the management team and how people work together and how that environment affects those people inside yes. um, the digital work environment is another part nowadays. Yes. Uh, and for digital, we uh, yeah we have uh, Wi-Fi, we have electromagnetic smog because of that. Um, and you wrote also a book about that. Uh, could you uh, it, share something? No, it uh, was it was a topic? paper uh, when um, it, it was it was the um, complementary medicine in uh, midwifery or something like that. It was a magazine. And the, uh, the, the person who, who ran, ran the magazine uh, had read the Boyle Frog Syndrome and asked me to uh, write a piece. Uh, it was about electromagnetic fields. And so it was, in the end, it was, it was a paper published by Elsevier, the scientific mm. people. And it was peer reviewed. And it was about uh, how uh, we design um, hospitals. And uh, um, the first thing that you see in a hospital is whether it's a private ward or a public ward, is that behind the head of the patient is an array of electromagnetic uh, vibrations and electronic and electric uh, um, buzzing going on. Why? It's for the benefit of the of the medical staff, of course. Uh, whereas that all that gear should be away from the head, certainly the head, as far away from the head as possible from the patient. But it was about 
the way in which the um, that we we are not dealing with electromagnetic fields, and we're not uh, um, uh, uh, with. It's not just living underneath uh, um, grid lines. It's about the interaction of the extremely weak electromagnetic field in the in the terrestrial that interacts with the solar uh, um, uh, electromagnetic fields and that's why you when you get a solar storm all sorts of other things do happen and um, and it affects us and so it was all about the way in which the the electromagnetic fields affect our, our mind and affect our consciousness and um, and our health and they are health hazards and uh, it I, it reminds me of when in the 20s and i think i wrote about it in i haven't read my book for 20 years but uh, is about where um it was where the you know the luminosity on on uh, watch dials mm -hmm. where all the watch dials were painted so you could see them in the dark mm -hmm. and people used to um, uh, take a dose of that and it it's it's uh, it, it is highly dangerous stuff it's it's um, it's it's not just magnetic it's it's atomic uh, um, stuff that, um, but they, they they went through a period of saying, oh, I've had my dose of, of radiation today. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then they collapsed. And so um, <clears throat> in the same way that uh, um, our logic tells us, for example, the people who designed the Titanic, uh, they produced, they designed uh, enough lifeboats for a third, for only a third of the total crew and complement of the ship, and and the, and the passengers, and uh, because you didn't really need lifeboats because it's unsinkable, mm -hmm. um, and we know what happened. So it's this um, direct logic that uh, without seeing other aspects and uh, it's like with having all this stuff behind your head and um, uh, I, I get I have had quite a lot of people from uh, doing other seminars about electromagnetic fields uh, I'm not an expert on electromagnetic fields but I do know about it uh, that's my job as <laughs> <coughs> yeah, actually there's also a uh, example of uh, this important uh, part but it's not the whole no. so uh, when you just focus on electromagnetic smog and try to solve that maybe you solve that issue but you disturb something else of course uh, you so do you should per definition uh, uh, yeah again approach it in a holistic way yeah. and and somebody should be trained or should be aware uh, that it should be done in that way and also a uh, capable of doing so and uh, yes we uh, come to a conclusion in this interview that the architect seems to be the most likely uh, profession who should uh, have that quality most of them don't have but they should have that quality that's because who else should do it that, that because that's what architects did yeah. go back into history and you'll find that's the uh, that's architects were there to serve uh, the uh, the citizens and the glory of the city and to um, create a healthy uh, environment to enhance the well-being and quality of life of the people and the environment and that's that's what architects mm. did mm -hmm. and that's what we need to do mm -hmm. <laughs> And your book, your book is going to bring more awareness back, or bring awareness back, because I hope so. Yeah, you did your own uh, uh, odyssey, your own quest uh, in in uh, developing uh, those inequalities, uh, reading tarot cards, and people would say, "And a famous architect reading tarot cards." 
Well, it's strange and dowsing. Uh, of course, <laughs> the dowsing you explained already, but how come that you came up to a tarot reading? Uh, well, because with tarot, the, the book, the authentic tarot, discovering your inner self is the, is the um, subtitle. And um, if you go to the ancient Tarot de Marseille, which is one of the oldest, it's not because it's old, it's just that it's authentic. And um, it takes you through uh, the, the initiation, if you like, the 21 steps we go through to take us from naivety to wisdom. It's nothing to do with fortune telling. Uh, or a prediction. Um, it's, it's just a way of understanding where you are in the present. It's nothing to do with the past or the future. It's where you are at the present and what is your next step to take you forward in your quest to become whole, to become complete, to become, as Jung said, to become that you already are. Mm -hmm. That is the quest, to become that which we already are. And so um, when you start to go into, uh, I mean, there are thousands of different tarot decks. Uh, one of my quests <laughs> at the moment, is, as it has, has been for some time, is to try and wean people off a deck called the um, uh, Rider Waite deck. And it was, it was uh, uh, um, that uh, the, the deck was designed by um, a guy who was really more of a magician. And in order to preserve, he thought, in order to uh, preserve the, um, the, 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 the sacred knowledge, if you like, that's, that was in, 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 those, in those cards, uh, that he swapped them over. So you get a different sequence to deliberately put people off the scent. Bearing in mind that uh, with Plato was severely criticized uh, um, when he um, uh, publicized the, uh, his book about where he expand, exp exposes the, um, uh, the, the way in which you create the golden section. Because until Plato did it, it was, a, it was always kept for the initiates so that you didn't hand that. It was very special sacred information. By sacred, it means nothing to do with religion, as you know. Mm -hmm. But um, and so um, he was severely criticised for for um, telling everybody. Uh, uh, and so you know, you think, well, uh, why should you try to keep secret the way in which you can create the golden section? And of course, now every uh, we we are handling the golden section uh, every day of our lives when we pick up a, a sheet of paper. It's in, in Europe particularly. It's, um, uh, it's either an A4 or A5 or whatever it may be. But when you fold it, it's like creating a, a, a nautilus spiral. Um, it, the, the proportions remain the same. So it, you can always pack it together. And, um, uh, and you can't do it by mathematics. You can't do it by arithmetic. You have to do it with a, uh, with a straight edge and a compass. It's the only way you can do it. Could you say that uh, for um, handling this wisdom, this sacred wisdom, uh, so sacred not in the sense of religious, but uh, hidden, yes. uh, you should have a certain quality, a certain uh, mastership. Because otherwise you would screw it all up uh, if yeah. you don't know what you're doing, although you got the right formula. Yeah, no, you, you can have the formula, but, uh, but you can use it for sinister purposes. Mm. And I think that this is what happened with the Hitler regime. 
uh, they were very involved with the occult. And the occult, what does occult mean? It means hidden. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And so they were, but they were very, and using that, uh, that sacred knowledge, if you like, um, uh, to their own ends, not for uh, spiritual enlightenment. And uh, so, but when, when you get to um, the tarot, uh, all the, the, the characteristics, the archetypal characteristics in the so-called major arcana cards, these are the things you will find in Mount Olympus. Or you find, as we saw uh, last night in, at the, the, in the uh, allegorical um, frescoes of Siena. Stunning stuff, but they're using all these uh, archetypal characters um, uh, uh, who are who represent aspects of 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 human beings and morality of ethics, if you like. So that sounds like that. Uh uh, all of us humans, we have to go through a cycle, our own cycle, to uh, get uh, our um, uh, rights of initiation uh, every yeah. step. So actually there's no shortcut. So although somebody uh, knows how it works, and uh, like you, you have so, so much experience, uh, it has no use in telling it, uh, supposing that somebody understands it and know how to use it, you have to go through your own process, uh, yeah, or is there a shortcut? Or, or can you say, um, we are swirling around and then somebody uh, gives you uh, the formula or some insight and then the only thing is you go on a higher level and, and still swirling there, so still confused, but on a higher level. If you, um, there's, <laughs> ask anybody, um, what happened to them when they were 42 years old mm -hmm. and plus or minus a year or two there will always be some profound significant event that will that has either changed them and tra to a transition to a, a different way of thinking a different way of life if you like or that they have withdrawn. I, um, the, um, the planet Uranus takes 84 years to go to the same spot in the sky as when you were born. It takes 84 years to go around. So when it goes round halfway round at 42 mm. <laughs> years, that becomes a very powerful period of change. In the tarot uh, you can find the same thing where you get to the point of the the, the middle of the, of the of a spread of 21 cards. It's, uh, it's the card, the 11th card which is it, it's called force and it's where she's opening the jaws of, of, a, of, a, of a, a, a lion. It's where, in fairy tales, you go into the woods. You go into the cave. In other words, you're going into the depths of your own stuff. It's like with Theseus uh, and, the, and the Minotaur. He has to go down into uh, the, the labyrinth to, um, to kill off this monster beast with the body of a man and the head of a, of a bull. And so he's going into his own psychology, if you like. Uh, what saves him is Ariadne, uh, because she gives him the uh, a gold, the, 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 the wool, uh, or its string, or however you, it's described. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, a ball of string, if you like. And he can trail it, because that's the only way he can trace his way back because he could kill off this monster, which he can do, but, is, but you can, so you can kill off and suppress the monster that's, 
or the, the, the your own psychology, if you like. But you've got to get back to the light because there's no point in doing that. So when you get into the tarot, that heart, that in the, the center card, the whole uh, tarot turns on this card. It's the most significant card. It's when you decide you're going to go into that cave, into the woods, or you say, no, don't want to know anything about that. <laughs> it scares me, and I, so you retreat. And you retreat into regret and, uh, and get a bit disappointed. Whereas you can start to move and you'll find that, in other words, the universe will always move us in the right way. It will tell us what we're doing. This is, uh, this is it's like with order and chaos. It's, in a, uh, it's, it's always cyclical. So at the moment, with all the incredible upsets and, and confusion in, in, uh, in the, globally in, in the world, that um, we're at the nadir of the, of the, of the, of, the uh, of chaos. But we, it will start to, to climb because this is what it does. It, it's the essence of the, the theory of fractals. And, and so we, 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 we can use and understand whether it's fairy tales or the tarot or, what, or, or the myths, that they have got the real basic fundamental guts of, of, of what we do and the way we do it. So, yeah, so, um, yeah. <laughs> I want to say several things at the same time. Uh, a few step back, uh, 42 years plus of minus one or two years, is what we call midlife crisis. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it is. That, yes. that, that period. Okay. Yeah. So that people can uh, uh, yeah. connect to that. Who am I? Why am I here? And what's my destiny? Indeed. And sometimes, also in my case, uh, yeah, it had a profound impact in my life. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, does yeah, with yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they look back. Indeed, indeed. And what you're saying, uh, yeah, people can say, oh, the world is going uh, mad and everything is uh, falling apart, religion, po politicians, uh, child yes. uh, trafficking, you name it. Everything is all of a sudden in, in, uh, on the surface. Uh, it was already there, but now it's clear. But it, it's a sign that we are almost, that is almost done. Yeah, it, we are. Uh, the sun is coming up again. Yeah, we are. Yeah, so that's a good... Oh yes, I'm Good looking thing. forward yeah. to that. <laughs> but you see, the interesting thing was about the, with Uranus that um, uh, some of the best work that Picasso did was when he was 84. Same with Verdi, created his best opera when he was 84. And so, um, uh, and I, I know that when I was 84, I, I had this surge to, um, uh, it's like, like a, uh, a, a, a new, capture a new part of, of, of going ahead, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was about the time when I started to, to, to think about, uh, about the, my latest book, to write it. And um, uh, that came about because uh, it was it's very strange that the, I, I, I because I'm a, I'm a fellow of the of the of the RIBA, I get their notices and, and, and on the internet and so on. And it was asking for uh, architects to volunteer to be mentors to uh, the postgraduate students and people starting their practice. And I thought, well, that'd be nice to give something to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, back to to the profession and um, so I set out my CV <laughs> and uh, sent it in 
and uh, I was refused oh. uh, because <laughs> too sophisticated. <laughs> no, 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 because I I wasn't running a practice. Oh, oh, oh. So, uh, but uh, uh, I was asked to, um, to to talk to the director of, of uh, she she runs the North London uh, group of architects, uh, Diane Small, and um, she's become a very good friend. But uh, so she then started to see how, um, although I haven't got to practice, I could still maybe contribute. And I was introduced to the North London practice, uh, uh, to the, the group, and I was asked to partake in a, uh, in, in a, 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 a three-way presentation on the role of the architect uh, because we're all very concerned about how uh, fragmented it is, how there's a loss of status and, and, and income and, and so on. It applies to uh, the UK, I think it applies to Europe, certainly applies to America as well. So uh, we, we don't, the, 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 the financial rewards are nothing compared to other professions, of the legal profession yeah. and the accountancy yeah. and so on. Yeah. We, we don't get it. And so somehow we've allowed the status to, to reduce and what has caused it. And it was because of this, the, the, the talk I was, the, my, my part of the, of the talk uh, about the role of the architect. And then I thought, well, I think there's a bit more to it than just that. Mm -hmm. So I started to look it further into the into the book, and I've also been asked from time to time uh, to update the boiled frog. One of the problems I had with getting the boiled frog published is that people were saying, "Well, really, this is three books," mm -hmm. and uh, and I kept insisting that it wasn't. They, all these things about that I write about in the Boiled Frog, about um, the things we've talked about now, are always they are of a, a common bond. They are they, they are not segregate, segregated. They are not fragmented. Mm. They are all part of the whole. And um, so I insisted that. Uh, Unfortunately, Wiley's did publish it, uh, Wiley's Academy. Um, but they, they, they would have preferred it to have been two books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will uh, add the, the title and the ISBN number underneath uh, on the YouTube uh, uh, film. Uh, maybe t as a closing, um, when you would, li uh, the question is, would you like to give an advice or a uh, suggestion? to a management board of a university campus, what they could do after hearing this. Uh, so that's one. And the other one, to the architect, to a architect or to the architect profession. Uh, what could they do to uh, contribute to uh, society, be of uh, service? Uh, yeah. Well, the first thing I would, let's take the architects first. Okay. That um, uh, the curriculum uh, for um, training architects is now not with the Royal Institute of British Architects, it's with the Architects Registration Board. And the people who they have on the Architects Registration Board uh, are not necessarily the best people to be talking to about what we are talking about here. Um, and so You've got to get away. They, these people want architects to make sure that there is conformance to all the vast areas of regulations and to make sure their buildings are wind and weather tight. And, uh, um, and in other words, it's a very matter of fact system. They don't mention seriously leadership they do a little bit and they certainly don't mention anything to do with the way in which um, uh, 
people tick and so on and I keep reminding them that architecture is about being of service to the citizen and the glory of the city and to deal with that you've got to not think of Vitruvius and and all the other people before him and after right up to the Enlightenment uh, these were architects who are dealing with some fundamental principles there is the core of being an architect and that is in that service so um, it's to get to the academics the people who are doing the, the work of teaching and uh, the nearest thing possibly is uh, to uh, um, it, it's, it's it's very it's very difficult to to get to I'm, I'm sorry I'm but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think and I think that the best thing to do would be for themselves to um, again to see where the fundamental principles are where are they what is it about life and living what is it about earth energy fields what is it about nature how do we and 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 respecting nature and um, and and feeling what is what where are we in nature we're part of it and and we think we're we're above it we, we, it it's it's very difficult to 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 change that mindset mm. yeah when, when when i may add that in our uh, discussion uh, we came to the point where we said uh, when you are lost go back to the last position where you know okay yeah i, I knew where i was uh, but to uh, practice that, you have to be aware that you are lost. So when you're not aware oh, that you are lost, no, <laughs> you will not do that. No, uh, quite. So actually that's what, you are, what I hear you saying about the academics who are teaching architects. When you are not aware that you are lost or that you are not telling the complete story, hmm. then it's difficult to change. Uh, uh, the, the academics, they should get out more. <laughs> <laughs> they should get out more into life. <laughs> okay. Uh, and to uh, uh, and I mean one of the things I would encourage them to do uh, with especially with the business management will be to do a field study trip to uh, to Siena to see the allegorical frescoes of Siena in the Pub Palazzi, Palazzo di Publico the, the the which was the town hall the 14th century town hall of Siena and it's now a museum but you can go into the very small council chamber and see where these very enlightened councillors who had a, a big diversity of from uh, the aristocratics down to the the tradespeople and the so-called folk wisdom folk uh, and there were 24 of them and they decided to have to commission uh, the painter uh, Lorenzetti uh, to, um, to, to paint the frescoes to express to the world as far as they were concerned uh, as a city-state to express to everyone their philosophy of how if you do this you create good government good citizens good good control of the of the country and, and production and so on and if you don't you get the tyrant and you get uh, you you get bad government and bad city and bad and bad countryside actually that's to go that that is all you need to do to see the results it's it's the consequence none of all, all this uh, um, stuff you can go to ethics and you can uh, read ethics of 
whether it's Socrates or Plato or whoever, you, and you can read as much of that stuff as you like. But you've got to see it, and and it's the uh, a picture is worth a thousand <laughs> words. Yes, indeed. <laughs> And that's where you'll see exactly, and all these characters who are in the frescoes are from the myths, the tarot, and, and so on. Actually, the secret is hidden in, in uh, plain sight. It's exactly. <laughs> yeah, so just, uh, and I assume that it will be addressed in your book, uh, this uh, Very fresco. much so, yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, and and you uh, with your last uh, explanation you answered in uh, a, a, a suggestion for management boards. They can also go to Siena and have a look, uh, or buy your uh, book first. Uh, well, buy the book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or listen to uh, to the presentation about uh, uh, the the tarot and the uh, how the tarot and the and the and the frescoes mix and 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 they coincide but yeah go go to go to uh, there's no point in just going you've got to read into it the 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 the, the, the symbolism what does do the, the the virtues tell us about good government what does how does this string that comes down from justice and feeds into the councillors. How does that work? And how about these guys here as soldiers who are protecting the city? And so on, and how does peace and tranquility, where does she lie? Where's, where are the scales of justice? Are they working? Not with the tyrant. And how, these are the qualities and the archetypal characteristics that you need to create good government, good management. And to the first, and the other thing which we haven't touched on is uh, managerialism. Yeah, maybe we can uh, say, you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, I think, okay. all right. Um, yeah. uh, with, uh, um, we now have this specialization and fragmentation and so you get uh, leaders and you get managers they are the strategists these are the tacticians and you then get over here uh, uh, not management but managerialism and the managerialists are the people who are um, really they they are uh, confining free speech they are telling uh, the entrepreneurs and the management and the leadership what they can't do what they mustn't do and so you get um, uh, more and more people that are it's like the conformance uh, departments if you like they are the people who are there not to produce anything they don't think about anything other than telling you you mustn't do it mm. or you 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 and there's one example where now with a, it's, it's happened to a banker friend of mine that um, if he wanted to take a client to to lunch he would have to tell his conformance, HR, human resources people generally, uh, that he wants to do this. They want to know how much he's going to spend, so I'm fine. But the client who he's going to take, the client has to say to his respective managerialists, um, I'm going to accept a lunch from my banker friend and they'll say um, uh, where is it going to happen how much are you going to spend and we need to know how much he's spending and where <laughs> and, and what you're talking about that is real mm -hmm. it's it is it's it sounds surrealistic but it's it's very real yeah, I know, yeah. and uh, so this is the sort of thing which is retarding 
the, uh, the, the, the people. In many ways you can have, when we had the lover, the uh, uh, magician, warrior and, and the lover, a uh, leader and lover, the lover uh, was a good guy. But when the lover is in, in his or her um, subversive state, they become managerialists. <laughs> That's what they do. They, they retard, they stop, they, they block. Mm. And, uh, and, and so you get people who are politically correct. Uh, oh, you mustn't do this, and mustn't say this, and so on. And we're played with it. And um, they should suck them more. Yeah, one could say, yeah, yeah, there were also some excesses and that's why we have some control now because, yeah, they went over the top. But the other way is, we, we uh, the, the balance went too far this side also. Now, yes, of course. Uh, of course, some control is okay, no, but now no, it's no, much, you've got much. To have now, control. You, now you stagnate everything. Uh, yes, but yeah. you see, this happens particularly, I mean, it's happened very much so in, in, uh, in, in the British government where uh, it's the, the, uh, the civil service mandarins, mm -hmm. the, the people who are, um, they have got their agenda. They want to see certain things. This happened very much so over the past three years with, with the, the European Union and Brexit and so on. But there, was, uh, there were people who, uh, they had their political agenda and it differed from uh, what the referendum was. And so um, they um, have, have done all sorts of, uh, of, 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 of things. To, instead of enhancing what was required to do, they uh, had their political agenda and said, no, this is what we're going to do. And they had the power to, to, to subvert it. Mm. Um, not that I want to get on to politics and Brexit and mm. so on, but but that they they can personify the managerialism that we have that permeates business life. So actually, besides that, you gave some uh, positive suggestions to architects and to management boards. Uh, this is a warning. Uh, yeah, if, uh, it is a warning. Yeah, yeah. it's um, do you, you you're there to serve. And it's, if you don't like what the leader wants to do, as it's the strategist, then move. Mm. Don't stay. It's, uh, anyway, there we are. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Oh, it's been yeah. a great pleasure yeah, talking yeah, yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, it's yeah, been yeah, a great yeah. pleasure to meet you anyway. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for your hospitality here in London. Oh, and, uh, it's been a yeah, pleasure. Highgate and um, who been. knows? When your book comes out, uh, I certainly will contact you and uh, we have a second uh, interview about oh, that. Oh, right. Yeah, yes, that, that would, would be, be nice. Yes. yes, we will do that. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you.